We have a steam measure for discrete optimization, sampling rare solutions via algorithmic quantum modeling. So, yeah. It's that. Good morning, everyone, and thank you. Uh, so, above, oh, right. so above all else, I have to thank the organizers for putting together that wonderful meeting uh, and for giving me the opportunity to be uh, here at ICTP. Uh, and I would also like to, uh, well, have to acknowledge my collaborators on that project, in particular the uh, Masud Mosheni, with whom we, we spent many hours discussing these topics. Uh, so the paper that I'm going to present, yes, closer. Oh, that would be. Okay, so the paper that uh, I would like to present has two angles to it. Uh, one deals with the notion of uh, diversity of solution in the context of discrete optimization. Uh, and then the second part is uh, some ideas about potentially how can you improve your diversity in the context of quantum mining. Uh, to give you some motivation why you may care, so, uh, there's a few points. So one, if you have your problem Hamiltonian, then in many cases it may be just an approximation of your true problem uh, that otherwise can be noisy or hard to express. And in that case, the true ground state of the problem Hamiltonian may have well, little meaning for the true problem. Uh, there is a closely related issue with multi-objective optimization uh, where you may want to have distinct solution to then be able to impose some additional constraint to select something that satisfies some additional constraint. Uh, also, some another angle, so diversity is a key hyperparameter in many heuristic algorithms such as genetic, genetic algorithms or uh, evolutionary algorithms. And we could continue that list if we had more time. Uh, so, but let me jump, mm, well, now we could try to define diversity in many ways, but we think that we should encapsulate two ideas here. One is that the, we want to focus only on solution that are of high quality. And in some sense, that's easy because we just limit ourselves to the idea to have solution below some energy threshold or solution with a small approximation ratio. Uh, and the second the solution should be mutually independent. And what I mean by that here is, well, we need some kind of a notion of distance between solutions, and then you can just use the Hamming distance or, distance or some kind of refinement of the Hamming distance that we use in our low dimensional examples. Uh, so here I will be always uh, normalizing it by the problem size. Uh, and we are just saying that the two solutions are independent if they are far away, sufficiently far away according to uh, that metric. And the idea here is that if you have a seed solution, then the standard Monte Carlo quite likely can be extremely efficient in sampling the uh, Bayesian of attraction. But uh, it may be extremely hard for Monte Carlo to jump to some other Bayesian of attraction to jump from one state to another state, well, using some local moves. Uh, and here we just combine those two ideas and just propose to define diversity as, well, the size of the maximal set that satisfies those two conditions. Uh, so one, so we want to have all the elements of that set to be of high quality, and each element of that set should be independent according to that matrix from on all the others. Uh, so in practice, this translates to a max click problem. Uh, so there's a lot of caveats here. So one caveat is that, well, that measure is not that easy to calculate. For one hand, that max click problem itself is NP hard. So what we do in practice, we just find some, use some greedy algorithms to approximate it from above. This works fairly well. Uh, well, more general fundamental concern is that all that I'm talking about here is 
find up to the best knowledge of the solution space that we have. Uh, which is even true even if we talk about approximation ratio and you may not know the exact ground state. Uh, but if you have that framework, then, well, you can do many things. So you can, for instance, define diversity ratio as for a given solver, just to see how many diverse Bayesian of attraction from the your best knowledge or the pool of all uh, solvers that you have, how many you can sample. Or you can use that framework to just compare two samplers or two uh, solvers uh, against each other. It's actually something like uh, that was done in the paper that was parallel to ours, done by the D-Wave team, uh, where they actually show that according to that metric, uh, quantum manila was showing uh, some quite huge advantage in time to diversity against the PT plus ICM in, in at least two classes of problems that they studied there. And well, it was equal in the first class. Uh, so all this is, I think, very nice. Uh, but let me show you also some example. Uh, and that is also one class of problems that I will be studying here. Uh, so this work we consider to uh, the lattice with nearest neighbor random interaction and some small local fields. And what I'm showing you here is just the ground state configuration. Uh, but apart from the ground state, there are also some distant low energy states all within the approximation ratio of 10 to minus three. And to jump from the ground state to, to another low energy state, you have to flip all the spin which are in that droplet. Uh, and so according to that definition from the previous slide, we will have six such states, each is at large distance from one another, so we have diversity six. Uh, so what you see here is, well, some effectively high dimensional subspace. Uh, and we can try to compare that measure with uh, I would say standard measure of dissimilarity of solution in single asset, that is Parisi other parameter. Uh, well, we sample from exactly the same instance and pretty much the signal that you are getting is completely washed out. Uh, so, but what is happening here that you are just, that the distribution of overlaps is giving you a one dimensional projection of some high dimensional effective structure. So because of that, it is not able to pick up uh, any signal. Uh, and for the reference, uh, well, the problem that we study are selected in such a way that we have a very good idea about what is the low energy subspace in that problem. And for that, we use some branch and bound technique, which is combined with well, tensor network contraction of the partition function of, of such a 2D lattice. Uh, so that has well, many limitations to, to execute that routine. You need to be basically two-dimensional or quasi-two-dimensional. Uh, but the nice thing about it is that when we run the branch and bound, we can use that locality to additionally build the full structure of hierarchical structure of excitation on top of the ground state. So in one run of algorithm, we are getting all the information to pretty much extract it. Uh, and it works extremely well for well, the system sizes that we have here. Okay, so with that I can jump to the second part of my talk. And here the idea is of inhomogeneous driving fields. So we have our driver here and notice that I put the driving term under the sum. So the driving term is not only time dependent but also position dependent. Uh, so what we are aiming at doing here is we kind of want to grow a bubble of new phase into the old phase. Uh, so you, you have a front that in time is expanding when we are effectively switching off the transverse field. Uh, and well, we have the control parameter that is the slope of that driving. And uh, well, there are two ideas here. So one idea is that, well, if that slope is zero, then that is your standard, uh, the uh, standard homogeneous quench. Uh, and this, value of that slope is 
allowing you to control the size of potential size of quantum fluctuations. So if you have everything is homogeneous, uh, then potentially you can have quantum fluctuation over full system. And if the slope is more steeper, then well, you're limiting in space. Uh, but there is another idea. Another idea is that, uh, well, part of the system is crossing the transition before the another part. And uh, if the velocity of that front is slow comparing to the velocity at which the information can spread in the system, then that can bias the spin, the spin that cross the transition can bias the spin that are crossing the transition and allowing them to adjust just to them. Uh, and so we have two limits. One limit is that alpha is zero or approaching zero, that's homogeneous transition. The other limit is we have extremely steep front uh, where you basically go one speed at a time. And both those limits are not so good, but quite often it turns out that there is some intermediate value of that control parameter that gives you some boost. Uh, because that showed up yesterday, let me just very briefly mention that if you just use the uniform transverse ring Ising chain, uh, then such a protocol gives you a pretty robust uh, shortcut in, this, in a square root speed up in the adiabatic time. Uh, but for more in kind of complicated system, uh, where there are some evidence that, well, in some cases, it can allow you to avoid Griffith singularities, and then you have exponential gain. Uh, there are some works from the group of Professor Nishimori in the first order transition, where they also, and in some cases, see exponential gain. Uh, but also, that is a protocol that you can run on D wave annealers. And well, again, there was some order of magnitude uh, improvements in some problems that were presented in that paper. Uh, but let me show you here the example that is the second class of problem that I have, and that is something like a quasi one dimensional chain, but with random interaction and such that each spin has six neighbors. So that may be frustrating. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is just such a inhomogeneous protocol. So we have a control parameter. So that's the standard quench, and that's the blue line. You see that it is flattening on the log log scale. So we are hitting, hitting exponential barrier. That's the median residual energy. Uh, the red line is very steep front, or relatively steep front, and it is not good either. Uh, but you see that for some intermediate value, you get some noticeable improvement in the residual energy. So that's nice. Uh, well, and that's exact simulation of the Schrodinger equation for such system. We can do in the quasi one dimensional setting. Uh, there's one more point that I would like to point out here. We also plot the optimal solution for each instance. Uh, that is kind of cheating here, but what I'm, why I'm showing it is that uh, that optimal alpha may be instant dependent. Uh, so what I will be doing if in all the work, we are always have a portfolio, actually, of slopes, and we average over the portfolio. But in the standard way, when we calculate time to whatever, uh, then we optimize over any link time. Uh, but that was kind of a basic test that gives us some hope that uh, well, we can move with those ideas to frustrated systems. But the actual thing that I want to present is based on uh, that work we had with Masud Moshani two years ago that was introducing the idea that you don't have a single front, but you have many fronts. Uh, and that is to avoid some shortcomings of, of a single front that well, is not doing anything with big part of the system at most times. Uh, and here what you, uh, there is a penalty to pay. And the penalty is that if you have some fronts and then you, try to collide them, then quite likely you will get the localized defect. Uh, but if somehow you can approximate the borders where that defect is not costly to you, uh, then that may be a good schedule. Uh, so we are trying right now to combine all those ideas that we have. So we run some experiments where pretty much we use the, we have our examples where we know the 
rough position of the boulders of the droplets. So that's the only, I don't take any information about what is the spin configuration inside, uh, but just divide, that is schematically shown here, divide the two dimensional system into clusters that roughly coincide with the boulders of those droplets. Uh, and doing so, we have a portfolio of both possible boulders and slopes. Uh, and we can go with that, uh, we can run our schedule. Uh, so here there is the quasi 1D setup and uh, what we have here in the dashed line is the reference homogeneous quench or the standard solution. Uh, the solid line is our protocol that we are uh, playing with. And we have different increasing system sizes. You see that there are very strong finite size effects that for 128 spins you don't see much difference, but actually when we go to 512, uh, then you can see a noticeable gain. And here what I'm plotting is the median time to diversity. And diversity on the x-axis is, well, diversity ratio. So how many diverse solutions from our baseline the, our solver was able to extract. Uh, so we have two limits. So one limit when the diversity is one, then pretty much we have been able to find all the diverse solutions of the solver was able to find all diverse solutions. There is the, another limit, there is that diversity ratio is zero and that is just corresponding to the standard time to solution. So kind of you have another angle that is uh, in a continuous way uh, going between the standard measure like time to solution to pretty much extracting everything that we know about low energy spectrum. Uh, we can play the same game in two dimensions. Uh, here that is a path integral Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, we have two system sizes. One is 30 by 30. The other is 40 by 40. The dashed line is again the bench baseline. Uh, and what we can see here that actually in that example, we don't get much gain in small diversity ratios. And small means that, let's say, time to solution here uh, don't give us much in this kind of uh, simulation that we did here. But when we actually we get some noticeable gains when the diversity ratio is larger, and that basically means that our portfolio was able to unfreeze some solution that well, in the reasonable time are not accessible by the standard protocol. Uh, so let me, as a pretty much last slide, second to last, uh, it is actually instructive not to look at, I was showing the med median over all the instances that we had, but there is a scattered plot as well. So we have different system sizes, but we have, well, that's time to solution. That's the diversity ratio is 0 0.8, so pretty high, that is 0 0.5. And uh, I would like to point out to actually the gray area. Gray area is time, timeouts. So we have quite a lot of situation in hard instances that neither of the solvers was able to pick up the signal within the, well, our simulation time scale. Uh, well, but those instances turn out to be quite hard for Monte Carlo or part of integral Monte Carlo and well, the life is hard. But the interesting part is here, then that is the part where the portfolio is winning. So we have quite a sizable portion of the instances that the homogeneous is timing out and uh, the portfolio is suddenly picking up some signal. So finding the solution sometimes in much shorter time scale. So I think, so that's pretty much, I think the, where the biggest, we see the biggest gain that uh, we can put with that approach, uh, it seems that sometimes it is possible to uh, get to the low energy solutions that otherwise would be uh, untractable for well, the standard protocol. Uh, and so with that, I can basically finish. I hope I was able to convince you that uh, well, diversity is something that one should care about in solvers or samplers, and when we talk about diversity, then what we need is some kind of a 
reasonable metric to be able to quantify solvers based on uh, that metric, and we propose one of such metrics. Uh, well, and the other that maybe there are some options or opportunities in uh, <coughs> combining something like a hybrid solver where you get an instant by instant uh, instant dependent input, you put it into your annealer, and because of that, maybe you can run it in secret, but because of that, uh, you can improve uh, the quality of the results that you get. And with that, I would like to thank you. Questions? Would you care to comment about generalization to higher dimensions or kind of more kind of you know, fractal or whatever what kind of problem, uh, some type of ge geometry that might be problem specific, uh, whether these concepts would likely be enhanced or reduced or? So, well, one thing that we have been doing here is a kind of a baseline because we have been able to <laughs> benchmark it, but there was a talk by Masut on Monday that was alluding on one of the possibilities to find those vortex. And then, well, there is an open game. Yes, you can try to see if that works. I can think actually on another example that I haven't tested, but I can tell you why not, that maybe you can just run your sample homogeneously, get some solutions, try to estimate what are the borders, and then try some different protocols. So kind of go in the loop. And, but that's, let's say, up to the future. So I hope I pick up your interest with that talk, and maybe that will go further. So regarding your last set of results, um, just a few clarification questions. So, so first of all, was that done with Quantum Monte Carlo? Is that what you're showing there? Uh, yes, that 2D is Quantum Monte Carlo, and that was done by Sergei Isakov. So pretty much we had, a, I sent him the borders, he ran the simulation, I got the data for him. Okay. I made the plot. Um, so and the other is, 1D is MPS, so that's showing right. equation. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand exactly what all the different uh, ingredients are that you're throwing into this to um, get these results. You're, you're talking about the inhomogeneous multiple fronts and and so on. So what, what exactly is the list of ingredients that uh, go into the improvement here? Uh, at least in the intuitive level to me is that if you have some idea where the low lying kind of droplet may be, then you can limit your problem to solve it only on the cluster. And uh, this combined the idea that you have a single front that is maybe good on in the, inside the cluster and you can do something better than homogeneous uh, with the idea that if you are able to get that insight from whatever way you, you get, uh, then the excitation you are getting are placed, are, are just localizing in the way where, where it is not costly. But on the other hand, suddenly you are then are able to pick from different many solutions because you are creating. Sorry, I, I, maybe, I think I didn't ask that clearly. So it, what is the list of things that you do in order to solve this problem differently from just standard running Quantum Monte Carlo? Okay, so we have, well, just for this solution. So we have our pre-processing. That's it. Uh, and we get, let's say, some kind of a border where to draw it, draw the borders. But then all we do is just run the annealing. Okay, so you need to optimize these gi of t functions somehow, right? Uh, so to get these results, so what we have been doing is we optimize over the total annealing time. Uh, that's one thing, and the other things, we have a portfolio, so we are averaging over portfolios, in the sense that apart from the pre-processing that is not included in time, the comparison is fair. So kind of, you have a portfolio, some runs in the portfolio get bad solutions, some give you a good solution, but on average, from that portfolio, you are getting more than just for repeating the same kind of simple procedure. <laughs> Go back to Einstein, if you that you repeat the same procedure and you 
shouldn't expect to be able to get different outcomes or well, possible outcomes. We are kind of expanding the span of protocols that you run. And but how do you find your GI of T functions? Is, how computationally heavy is that? And, and does that go into the time uh, to so when diversity? We have that borders, uh, then we just start to, well, we have one parameter that is that slope. Uh, we pretty much, that was random selection from some sample. And then you just grow, grow it out. And you do it, well, you have your total annealing time. This gives you the velocity. The kind of one constraint is the total annealing time. And you just grow it from the center outward. And that's it. OK, thanks. Other questions? Let's thank the speaker again. Okay.